Hi, this is a new method that we're going to use to try to communicate in the middle of the week. Just to have a little bit of extra uh, word to study and think about, see how it might affect what's going on in our lives. Also to have a little prayer time, uh, doing that as a, as a group through this medium. And it's just a, a way to connect. In fact, that's what we're calling it, Midweek Connection. So we're going to use this to, to just stay in touch and to try to provide a, an encouraging word from the Lord. We're going to be going verse by verse, in fact, sometimes word by word, through 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter was written to a scattered church. Uh, the church that developed in Jerusalem kind of maintained that as, as home base. And because of that, they were very comfortable staying at home. Now, the only problem was that the last thing Jesus told them was that they were to go to the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, you're not going to go to the uttermost parts of the world and stay at home in Jerusalem. So God created a, a situation that caused a bit of turmoil and uh, I guess you could just say strife, rubbing. Uh, the friction in their life was so intense that they had to scatter and leave Jerusalem and, and go to other places. Well, those that did so are the ones that Peter is writing to. And he's doing this to give them a word of encouragement, uh, a word of support, and also perhaps some information that might help them deal with uh, the circumstances that they're under right now. So I want to work through this with you. And what I'm going to be doing, I, I have a... a Bible study program that I use that gives me uh, the Greek or actually uh, Greek or Hebrew and then the the word and its translation but it puts it in the order that it's written in those manuscripts we in English we write in a more consistent pattern our our sentences make sense the the words follow each other they don't do that in Greek or in Hebrew uh, they'll put an important word up before the place that it actually fits in the sentence. And so you kind of have to read this in a, in a context to understand what's, what's going on. And so Peter starts out writing uh, his message to them and identifies himself, Peter, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect sojourners of the dispersion of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now those were the communities, the cities, or, or uh, country aspects of, of, of those nations where the people had gone to. They had scattered into those areas, and most of those were up to the upper part of the Mediterranean uh, into what now would be Turkey, basically, but up into those areas, but escaping what was going on in Jerusalem. Now, he identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he is writing to the elect sojourners. Now, in your Bible and in mine, it, it has the word elect down in the second verse, coming down uh, at, at a place that it's not in the original language. Uh, in other words, the, the, the word ekletos, uh, that we get the word elect from, actually means called out ones. Uh, ek means out of, uh, kletos, called. And so these were the called out ones who were called out to be sojourners. Sojourners are those who have no uh, real home. They're, they're travelers. They're, they're scatterers. They're, they're yet to be settled in a place. So they're sort of just drifting along, finding their way uh, to some new place to, to live. Um, when you look at this word, ekletos, and just stop with it as being elect, sometimes people associate the word chosen with that, but it is always pointing to chosen or elected to do what? And that is in this, to be sojourners. That was God's choice for them. Now that's important because a lot of times when we have uh, very serious things happen in our life, uh, we almost uh, immediately believe God has failed us. He has left us. Uh, we have been disappointed by our God. 
Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, sojourners may feel like we have been kicked out of our home. We have no place to go. But when you attach that word sojourner or person going through this difficulty or whatever I'm facing with the fact that God had intended that for us, it puts purpose on it. There's a reason behind this. It's not just that I'm a victim of circumstance, but I belong to a God who is directing the path of my life. Now, he is directing that toward the dispersion, the scattering about. Now, this particular scattering has a context in, in history, in the book of Acts, in Acts 1. And you're going to remember this, but let me take you back there um, uh, Saul, I was going to say Paul, but his name at that time was, was still Saul, was, was a part of the stoning of Stephen. He may have been an agitator. He may have been someone who was literally giving permission for this to take place because he was a Pharisee. But here's the, the, the section out of Acts 8.1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed there undercover, but they stayed there. So some devout men who remained behind buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So God used that moment of the stoning of Stephen to shake the church up and to get them out of their comfort zone, sending them out into the world. And as they went, they took the gospel with, with them, basically. Now, here's another reference to that in Acts eleven nineteen. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. Well, that, that's what Peter said in this introduction. Those of this dispersion that happened in association with Stephen's death, martyrdom, went to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, then he basically is going to give a context for their life. Again, if, if you ever just stop with the incident, with, with the circumstance, with what's going on, sometimes we lose sight of what God is doing in the midst of all of this. And so he says that all of this happened. They were uh, uh, chosen to be sojourners so that they might scatter this gospel around. He says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctification of the Spirit into obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this is one of the, the rare moments in Scripture where you have uh, some definition or some uh, um, illustration of the Trinity. You have God the Father, you have the Spirit, and then you have Jesus, God the Son. And so in those three, you find out that each one is functioning in Christians' lives in their own unique way, that the Father is working by foreknowledge. That basically means he brings the plan and the purpose together into a person's life. So he is acknowledging what he wants to accomplish in their life and how he wants to accomplish that. And then the sanctification of the Spirit into obedience. Now, sanctification means separate, separation, designating for special use. So the, so the Spirit is taking the plans of God that are then placed on the individual Christian and then is using that to separate them into the purpose that God has for them. And attached to that is obedience, to sanctify them, set them apart so that they will obey the Lord in all of this. Now, the word obey in this also means compliance. They will come into compliance with God's will. You'll find many of the aspects of our struggles are against what God is trying to accomplish. 
We fight against him. We resist him because we don't like what's going on in our lives. And so as a part of that uh, uh, process that he's working on us to, to get us toward his plan and purpose, if we have any sense of rebellion against that, then we're not going to obey and we're not going to be compliant to his will. So the Spirit is at work softening us, trying to give us perspective, trying to show us and teach us the things we need to do as he separates us from those desires to not follow after what God wants us to do. And then you have the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now we know from our Old Testament studies that the sprinkling of blood was a a, a crucial part of the ceremony within the temple itself. Uh, one of the things that the writer of Hebrews said in trying to bring that old into the new, he said in Hebrews 9, 21, in the same way uh, God sprinkled, I'm sorry, the, uh, the high priest sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. And according to the law, almost all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So in their ceremonies, the the blood was used as a cleansing agent. And so it was designed to to allow the implements within that temple to be cleansed so that they could be used uh, by the high priest to worship and serve God. And then he goes on and says, now also realize this, without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. So when the sprinkling of Jesus' blood is applied, as Peter said, it connects us immediately with our forgiveness. The forgiveness that he gave us allows us access into the life that he died to provide. So Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So anything within our minds and hearts that are resistant to God's will, Peter is saying that this sprinkling of the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from those thoughts, those conditions that we placed on God that are unfair to him and and improper for us and can then take us back to our cleansing, which is really the only thing we can hold on to. God, I, I, I know I belong to you because I have been cleansed. And regardless of what's going on, that can never be taken away. And then he moves into that last section there. And it says, according to this knowledge of God, foreknowledge of God, the sanctifying of the Spirit, and the sprinkling of Jesus' blood, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, there's a very important aspect throughout the New Testament particularly the New Testament is, the, is the, the section of the scripture that, that teaches us about the grace of God. The Old Testament has grace throughout it, but you don't see it like you do in the New Testament. We see more of the judgment of God, uh, the, 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 the punishment aspect of disobedience. And you see all that more in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we start seeing the grace of God applied. And it wasn't just something that suddenly appeared. It's always been there but we see it more in the New Testament. And so that was a, a cry or may a, a, a greeting or, or, or a, a dismissal. Okay, see you, grace and peace be upon you. Uh, but it was a common expression of the people receiving the grace of God, God doing for them what they couldn't do for themselves, uh, God extending himself uh, to, be, to be able to do in their lives things they don't deserve him to do, But that's the cry of of the church, the cry of the Christian. Father, give me grace. I need your grace. And then with the grace comes the peace. Uh, We'll never be at peace until we've experienced the the grace of God. And then that last statement uh, may be multiplied to you. It it is actually a wish uh, that he is is saying this, that it's not a, a guarantee It's not something that you can just say, okay, grace and peace are going to be multiplied to me. No, it is a a wish. May God so multiply this in your life. Uh, I want you to experience grace and peace. I want you to learn to absorb the things that God is doing in your life. 
And so he brings us into the the realization that what he has done has long-term implications, and regardless of what's going on in our lives, it is still within the boundaries of God's foreknowledge, his his plans and purposes, uh, within the sanctifying of the Spirit to draw us separate from the world so that we can enjoy and embrace the things of God and also the uh, experience of the sprinkling of Jesus' blood to cleanse us and uh, align us properly with our God so that we can experience the grace and peace. Well, we'll stop there in our study, and we'll pick up there next time. But let's look at a few of the things that we need to be praying about uh, this week. Uh, We have a lot of things on our prayer list, and I know you get that. Uh, by email from the the church office, but there's some things that are happening. We have several families that are struggling with their pipes uh, from our big freeze. They still haven't gotten their house put back together. They've still got uh, a mess uh, all over. They're waiting for some way to get that reconciled. Uh, In fact, I, I talked with a man yesterday who said, I still have no water because I've not been able to get a plumber to come to my house and fix the problem. Uh, There's a lot of plumbers out there doing a lot of work right now, and a lot of people are still suffering because of that, and we need to to keep them in mind. We've had a a couple of our members who have just found out that they have cancer, and uh, they are in the midst of the discovery part, find out what does this mean, Uh, How's this going to affect me, my life? And we go on from there. So uh, keep in mind Bonnie Miller. Uh, They're finding out tomorrow uh, what the scope is of this. Uh, The the doctors have run tests, and they're now going to lay out the plan for her life. So uh, lift lift Ed and Bonnie to the Lord uh, for that. Uh, Also, um, uh, Cindy Wiggins. One of our members, they recently moved away, but they're still part of our heart and our family, uh, just found out she was diagnosed with a form of cancer that has stumped her doctors. So they need a special prayer, a prayer for the doctors to give them insight, to find out what's going on, what they can do about that, and how they can relate to it, find out what's, what's going on. Uh, there are several of our members who, who care about other people in the neighborhood or friends. Uh, we, we've got some that, that are praying for grandchildren. We've got some who are praying for friends, again, in the neighborhood. Uh, so when you get your, your prayer list, be sure and take time to work your way through those. But I just want you to kind of be aware of those recent ones and uh, kind of keep them in, in prayer because they're uh, struggling right now. We have other people who continue, who have been on our list for a long time. Don't, don't just skip over this. Work through it and, and pray for these. So let's, let's pray right now, and then I want to pray for you, all right? Father, I thank you that even in this uh, method of connection, Lord, you're a part of this moment. You hear us when we pray no matter where we are, what's going on. And Father, we just want to lift these concerns to you, Lord, particularly uh, Bonnie and and her situation, and um, uh, also, um, well, I'll get it, Cindy, as she finds out some things about her own. So Lord, we want to lift them to you in particular. And also the others who are struggling in ways that seem trivial almost, I've got a problem with my house, Lord, that's not. That adds such a strain and stress on people's lives. So uh, provide solutions, help them get their place back to normal so they can get over this and, and move on forward. Uh, Lord, there, there are people on our list uh, in the community, uh, a, young, a young boy, teenager, that committed suicide. Father, what a, what a struggle for his family to, to deal with that. And uh, Lord, to find hope uh, in something that was so devastating to them. Uh, Lord, there are other issues of uh, depression that's setting in, of, of just anxiety that's overwhelming us. Lord, help us to find that way to look up instead of down and to see you instead of our, our problems. So, Father, give courage to all of our people. And, Lord, to those listening right now, Lord, I don't know what's going on in their particular life, but you do. You're the God who has complete knowledge of every one of us, So, Father, I pray that you will give them the courage to trust you with whatever it is so that right now they can find peace in you because what they're carrying has been lifted to you 
and their burden is not something that they have to bear any longer. Father, for those needing answers, Lord, give them answers. For those needing hope, give them hope. For those needing encouragement, Father, lift them and help them to get through the things that are bringing them down. Father, for those who are still sick with COVID, Father, please give relief and let them get beyond that. And Lord, let it not be a lingering issue in their life. And Father, continue to protect the rest of us. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our church, even in spite of these days of being uh, shut down because of the, of the flood. But Lord, we'll look forward to the day that we can all be back together, worshiping together here at our church. So Lord, bless our folks. Give them courage to trust you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for spending this time with me. And I trust we'll do the same thing next week. A little different environment, but it'll do the same thing. So God bless. See you next time. Bye-bye.